Hi, I'm Pastor Jimmy. I'm so glad that you are joining us today for our worship service. Well, today I am at Robinson's Greenhouse and Farm Market. You know, they are some wonderful people that are part of our community. And as you can see, they've got a lot of exciting things going on here. In fact, right now I am standing in the middle of their new expansion project. And I am grateful that they would let us share our time together here at this place. You know, every building, whether it would be a garage, a greenhouse, a, a house, or a great cathedral, must start like this building with a good foundation. I wanna to talk to you about that today. As we are building our lives, how is your foundation? My sermon text today is found in the Old Testament, Psalm 128. It says, how happy are those who fear the Lord all who follow his ways. You will enjoy the fruit of your labor and how happy you will be, how rich your life. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine flourishing in your home. And look at those children that sit around your table as vigorous, healthy as young olive trees. That is the reward of those who fear the Lord. May the Lord continue to bless you from Zion. May you see Jerusalem prosper as long as you shall live and may you live to enjoy your grandchildren and may Israel have quietness and peace you know one day there was a man that had a crack that appeared upon the wall of his bedroom and so he called a painter to come and fix it well the painter came and he cut around the hole and he replastered and then 
repainted the wall. Within two weeks, that single crack appeared again, but now it was joined by the family of cracks. Now, the painter returned and once again fixed the cracks on the wall. But by the end of the month, not only was that crack back and the family of cracks, but all of their friends and relatives came too. This group man was so frustrated so he decides to call a different painter to come. The painter comes and looks at the wall and instantly he tells the man, sir, you don't have a crack problem. The man says, wait a minute, what do you mean I don't have a crack? Look at it, I got cracks all over the place. The painter said, sir, you really don't have a crack problem. You have a foundation problem. That's the problem you have. You have a shifting foundation. The cracks that are on your wall, sir, they're just a symptom of a greater problem. You will forever be fixing cracks on your wall if you don't solve the foundation problem that's underneath your house. I believe today there are many people that are they're spending a lot of time and energy fixing the cracks on the walls of their lives. If you haven't realized it yet, we have a foundation problem in America. In fact, we have a foundation problem in the Red Bank Valley. There could even be a foundation problem in the house where you live. Maybe there's a foundation problem in your life today. So I've come to tell you how to fix the foundation. And if you don't, you will forever be patching and painting the walls of your life. The reality is, that too many people are living patchwork kind of lives. Uh, by that, I mean they'll patch it up right for a little bit, you know, right, right now with a, a job over here and some money over there. Sometimes they're having relationship problems. Instead of fixing them, they just patch them up. But again, if you wait long enough, cracks again will appear. Too many times we are living patchwork kind of lives. Some of you might be going through some marriage problems or, or difficulties. You're struggling. And so you're hoping to patch things up. So you, you plan the family vacation of a lifetime. Or, or you build a new house or have a new baby or, or decide to buy a new car. But quickly, reality sets in. After you've bought the new this or got the new that or built the new house, again, it, all, it gets old. It gets old very quickly because you're still living in that same house with the same people. That's when you find out that you have a shifting foundation. You see, if you're really going to be a Christian and you're going to live the Christian life, it's going to have to be built properly. It's going to have to start at the right place with the right foundation. God has given us four relationships in life. One is personal, two is family, three is church, and then the last one is community. You see, many people are trying to fix the problems of their community before they solve the problems in their own lives. People want to fix the problems in their family when sometimes they're the ones that contribute to the problems. Psalm 128 outlines this for us, what's called a well-ordered life. If you want to fix the cracks on the walls of your life, then you need to have a well-ordered life. You may be saying, what's a well-ordered life? A well-ordered life is a life that is set properly from start to finish. The psalmist says in Psalms, he, he kind of lays it out for us today. Again, in Psalm 128, if you have cracks in your life, cracks that you might be hiding behind a picture or a lamp, and even though they're hidden and out of sight, you know those cracks are still there. But as I said, in Psalm 128, he begins first by saying, how blessed, how happy is everyone who fears and worships the Lord, who walks in his ways and lives according to his commandments. The psalmist starts out by saying, before you run out and fix the world, or you try to fix uh, people, Man, you need to fix yourself first. Happy is the person whose hand of God is on their lives. They have been touched by God, and now they fear Him. The psalmist says the place to start 
is in your life. It's not fixing your family, fixing the community, fixing your church or the society. But the place to start is getting God in the right place in your life. Again, the psalmist calls it the fear of God. The, the author of Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire. He is not to be taken lightly. Think about it for a minute. Any God that could create a place called hell should not be played with. Any God that could send people who die in their sins to an eternity separated from him should not be taken lightly. He is to be feared. But on the other side of the coin, he is also to be reverenced and honored and respected. So basically, the man and the woman who fear God, in other words, they really believe there's God. They, they really take him seriously. You see, the problem I think is today is there are a lot of people, and you may be one of them, you believe there's a God, no doubt about it. In fact, uh, uh, you know, you, you believe in him but you've never taken him seriously. In other words, you live your life any way you want to. You know that somewhere out there, sure, there's somebody that's responsible for all of this creation. There's somebody that created the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars, but you have never taken him seriously. You don't fear him. You've never given him first place in your life. Maybe there are some of you that would say, you know, Pastor Jimmy, I should be dead, but you know, God did spare my life along the way. In other words, the only reason you're here today is because of the grace of God. But yet, even though all of that's happened and that's your testimony, you still don't fear him. Maybe you've made promises to God. A lot of people have done that. I've done that along the way. You know, you have a test result that you're waiting to come back. Maybe you're in an ICU unit at the hospital. And you promise God, God, if you spare me, if you spare my child, I will serve you the rest of my life. Well, the test came back negative or God healed you or your child was spared. But the sad part is God hasn't heard from you since. Why? Because you don't fear him. You don't take him seriously. But to the man and to the woman who take God seriously, and seek to follow him and live their lives for him. God has three promises found here in Psalm 128. Number one, he will care for your fortune. The verse says, for you shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands and he will look after you and you will become his responsibility when you take him seriously. I love that. When you take God seriously, he becomes your father. You become his child and he watches over you. God takes personal responsibility for your well-being. Number two, he will take care of your feelings. Verse two says, and you will be happy. I know there's a lot of people today. They're looking for happiness. Maybe, maybe that's you. But when I talk about happiness, the happiness that I'm talking about is a deep, joyful peace that God offers us. Not superficial happiness or circumstantial happiness that happens when good things come our way. No, not at all. I'm talking about a happiness that surpasses the struggles we face. I'm talking about a happiness that makes you happy when you should be sad, that makes you laugh when you should be crying the kind of happiness that reaches way down deep in the soul. The psalmist said, when God is in the right place in your life, he's going to take care of your fortune and he's going to take care of your feelings. Number three, when God is in the right place, I want you to know he's going to take care of your future. Uh, the best way I can describe this is in the words of an old hymn. It simply says, it is well, it is well with my soul. Did you know that when God is in the right place in your life, we don't have to worry about anything. We don't even have to worry about tomorrow because God has got tomorrow covered. Now you might be asking, how can that be? Because God's already been to tomorrow and back. You see, one of the attributes of God is that God is eternal. That means that God has no past and no future. Everything is present tense with God. 
That's why we need to accept him right now today into your heart and life. If you don't have a relationship with him, you need to. Yesterday's gone and tomorrow may never come, but we have this moment today. That's why it's time for us to buckle down and get serious with God. I, listen, I really believe all of us think that we have a lot of days and a lot of years left and ahead of us. That there will be many more opportunities for you to accept Christ into your life. But if you want a life that is centered, if you want a life that's on target, if you want a, a stable life, you want stability, then right now you need to reposition God into the center of your life. God doesn't want to be on the outskirts or the suburbs of your life. He must be the center of your life. Can I ask you a question? Let me just take a minute. Where is God right now in your life? Have you ever taken pictures before? You know, when you get that new camera and, and you, you, you begin to take pictures. Now, you may not know a whole lot about the camera, but the key is you have to get the object or, or the subject into the center of the box in order to take pictures that you can use and that you want to keep. Oh, I remember the first time I got a camera. When I got when I got the film back and I got the pictures back, listen, man, I had heads chopped off. I, 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 I didn't take them properly. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off into all that. What I'm trying to say is you don't have to understand God, but you've got to get him in the center, in that little box of your life. And if you get him in the center of your life, like in that little box taking the picture, he will take care of the picture taken. He'll, he'll fix everything that's wrong. But again, he has to have the center of your life in order to do that. I want you to know today, I have not given up. I, I really have not. I believe God can fix America. I really do. But you see, it's going to take people that are willing to take a stand, to vote, to stop taking God out of everything and eliminating his images and words and even the very name of God. It's going to take Christians that will stand and say no, stand and pray until we can get God back into the center of America again. He said it this way, if I would be lifted up, I will draw all men, all men unto me. But I want you to know, first, before we can get America back into its right place, please hear me, don't miss this. This is key. God must be the center of your life first. Maybe there are some of you today that God is not in the center of your life. Why? Because maybe you don't know him. You've never committed your life to him. Or you won't let him be the center of your life. Or you say, you know what? This Christian life just, it's too costly. No doubt there are some of you that maybe at one time you were a Christian. You had God in the center of your life, but you have shifted the focus of your camera and you wonder why the pictures of your life are not coming out right. I want you to know if God is not at the center of everything, then everything will be off balance. Why? Because the subject of life, God, is no longer the center. Today, if by chance you're kind of living an independent life, in other words, you get up every morning and you kind of do your own thing and go your own way, go to your job, live your life the way you want to. I want you to know in all honesty, there is nothing that God dislikes more than us just being independent. We don't need him, we don't care. We just wanna do everything on our own, in our own strength and our own ability. Finally, verse 3 says, your wife will be a fruitful vine. And those children around your table, they'll be like olive plants. In other words, when Christ is in the center, that's what happens. When men are right with God, when women are right with God, it follows you home. And your home will be blessed. Husbands and wives and children will thrive and grow. 
Now, no doubt there's a man out there right now, sorry ladies, let me just talk to the guys, that says, Pastor Jimmy, that sounds good, but you don't know my wife. I'm married to the Secretary of War, and I'm sure you ladies have a few things you'd like to say. But again, I want to talk to the men. Guys, it doesn't matter. You may say, no, it does matter a lot. Just give me a minute. I want you to know, fellas, if you're right with God, then because you're right with God, then you, her husband, becomes what Ephesians 5 calls her savior. So when you walk in the door, salvation walks in that house because men, you've been with God. He's the center of your life. And because of that, things are going to be different. I love the old song we sing that says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light for my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins which were many are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. I wanna ask you today, are you ready for change? Are you ready to let him in? Are you ready to give him first place in your heart? Jesus says today, today is your day. Today is your day of salvation. I want you to know today, if you do not let him have first place, heaven cannot be yours. So would you take a minute and quietly and personally examine your life right now? Are there any cracks in your life? If so, you have a foundation problem. Anyone listening today, would you be willing to cast your pride aside and say today, God help me, God help my marriage, God help my kids. Today, if you ask him to forgive you of your sins, if you'll invite him to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior, you believe that he died for your sins on a cross and that the grave could not hold him so he has risen and he now reigns from heaven above my friend if you'll do that you will have put him in the center of your life and you have shored up your foundation and now he is lord lord of all amen can I share one more thing with you before we go? You know, they tell us that we have a growing generation of non-committed kids in our churches. You know, I really don't think it's a kid's problem. Here's why. Many kids have not seen us adults commit our lives to Jesus and to make him a priority in our lives and in our worship and being involved in church and the things of God. You see, we have failed to live and communicate and tell them that he is so important that their whole eternity hinges on knowing him and letting them know that God needs to be a priority in their lives. We must tell them to let Jesus have first place in their hearts. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you today for this day. I thank you for standing in a place that is being built on a sure foundation, reminding us that as we build our lives, we got to start in the right place, and the right place is getting you in the center of our lives. And with that, it gives us a secure foundation. Father, if there was anyone today that said, yes, I'm struggling, yes, I'm having problems, or yes, one time I had a relationship with God, but I've, I've kind of gotten away from that. Again, all they have to do is ask you into their hearts, forgive them of their sins and mistakes, and you will begin to take first place in their hearts. Again, we thank you for this day, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I want to thank the Robinsons uh, for allowing us to, to be here on their place to share in our worship service with you today. Again, I never take it for granted. I'm so glad that you're watching. Again, we love you. Uh, keep holding on and pressing forward. Have a great week.